Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billah al-sami al-alim min al-shaytan al-la'in al-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen. Habibi ilahi al-alameen Abil Qasim al-Mustafa Muhammad. Wa ala ahli baytihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin al-ma'asumin al-muntajabin. Qala Allahu fi kitabihi al-hakim. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا تجعل يدك مغلولة إلى عنقك ولا تبسطها كل البسط فتقعد ملوما محسورا صدق الله العلي العظيم وصلوا على محمد وآل محمد The 30th of the month of the Al-Qa'da is considered to be the anniversary of the martyrdom of the ninth Imam of the school of Ahl al-Bayt, Al-Imam Muhammad al-Jawad, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. And Al-Imam al-Jawad, alayhi salam, uh, passed away at the age of 24. So much of his, his life of, of giving his contribution to humanity uh, rather, all of it took, took place in, during very, very formative years. And uh, the verse that I shared with you is from chapter 17, Surah Al-Isra, verse 29. وَلَا تَجْعَلْ يَدَكَ مَغْلُولَةً إِلَىٰ عُنُقِكْ وَلَا تَبْسُطْهَا كُلَّ الْبَسْطِ فَتَقْعُدَ مَلُومًا مَحْسُورًا It's a piece of advice. And I'll read the translation for you. It says, And let not your hand be shackled to your neck, nor let it be entirely open, uh, open lest thou should sit condemned and destitute. And this verse speaks of the essence of giving. How do we give? And it depicts a, a vivid example a very meaningful example that says, don't hold your hand shackled to your neck. Meaning, don't be stingy with what you have. If you've ever tried to take something from a child, what do they do? They bring it here to their neck, and it becomes a war, especially when they're at their uh, early formative years. Some people refer to them as Terrible twos. They're terrific twos, not terrible twos. You call a child terrible for an entire year and then expect them to be an angel. And this is serious. How you describe your children, the words that you use don't describe your reality. Your words create your reality. So when you say, I'm terrible, or she's terrible, or he's terrible, or I'm stupid, I'm dumb, you can't expect to be an enlightened, edu educated individual and say those things about yourself because you create your reality. Your words are very powerful. But So don't say terrible twos. Don't say three-nager. They have a long time to become a teenager. But it's, it's, they, they want to hold back. They don't want to give. And sometimes when it comes to giving, the Qur'an says you hold your hand to your neck as if, as if you're a child, as if someone has to pry the charity or the donation or the investment or the contribution out of your hand the same way you have to pry something from the fingers of a child. So neither this nor the opposite. Don't extend it out completely, which means don't be irresponsibly generous. Some people are irresponsibly generous. They give away everything. They take away from their loved ones in order to give to others. I was watching a documentary one time, and uh, it, it described a number of people who had won the lottery, millions of dollars. And what happened to their lives? And you hear some of the most depressing stories. One couple, an elder couple, 
And of course there are parallels. One parallel is everyone comes out from behind a car or a bush and claims that they're related to you so that you can give them some money. But one couple, an elderly couple in particular, they said that one of the biggest curses in our life was the fact that we won the lottery. Because we started to give to our family members and in particular, we, gra we gave to one of our beloved granddaughters. We kept giving her and giving her and giving her. And she adopted a certain lifestyle. She started going out and drinking and taking drugs and partying because she had money at her disposal until finally she killed herself. They said this was a curse in our life, this money that came into our life. Because they were irresponsibly generous. Sometimes we feel like when we give, we are doing someone a favor. The Quran says, don't be irresponsibly generous. Have moderation. And I want to talk about that because the, the life of Imam al-Jawad in, in the Arabic language, the word Jawad is a description for an extremely generous person, someone who was a giver. His life was a life of giving. It was a life of contribution. But before that, I, I want to focus on and, and, and share with you some concepts that I've been thinking about. And to be able to give, we, we, we start to learn to give as we grow out of childhood and as we pass into the stages of maturity. Of course, some people never develop the mindset of contribution and giving. And I've, I've said this before, and I'll say it again that babies, if you observe them, are pretty selfish. They're not very generous. Because you've got to do everything for them. And they only want to take. They don't want to give. So some, some of you may say, no, well, they give happiness. I promise you, it's not intentional. They don't, they don't give it intentionally. Maybe some babies, if they can, they would take that away as well. But we learn to become givers. And some people, you see they live you know, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and they never learn to become givers. What does that tell you? They never grew out of that baby-like mentality. Inside, this person's not an adult. Inside, this person is still a baby, still expecting to receive all of the time without having to contribute and give anything back. I heard a story one time. One day, a man said to his wife, he said, you know, what's, what's your deal? You're always telling me give, 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 give. You've never said take one day. You're always saying give, give, give. So she turned to him. She said, you want, you want me to say take? He said, yeah, just at least once. She took a broken pair of high heels that she said she had. She gave it to him. She said, go take it to the repair. Here, take. <laughs> so we learn to become givers. This is what the Qur'an teaches us. And I want to share a concept with you. Some of you may be familiar with this, and some of you uh, may not be familiar. I've, I've mentioned this uh, a few times, but when it comes to our relationships, the relationships that we have with people in general, and sometimes, you know, when, when I speak about relationships, it's not only your spouse, your uh, coworker, your neighbor, your friend, a number of years ago, many years ago, uh, the training manual that the company IBM used to give to their salespeople used to, it, it used to tell them that once you have about four exchanges with people, that's the beginning of a relationship. So hello, how are you doing? Where do you live? What this? Where do you go to work? That's the beginnings of a relationship. So sometimes that happens very often throughout our, our weekly or monthly interactions. That's a relationship. That's the beginnings of a relationship. So for, for all different types of relationships, there's a concept that suggests that we are either creating value or we are extracting value. Meaning that we're either contributing, we're making deposits, or we are making withdrawals. And, and some writers, they refer to this as the emotional bank account. That with every relationship you have in your life, there's an emotional bank account. So my relationship with my wife, my relationship with my parents, my relationship with my children. 
And in order for there to be a healthy relationship, we need to make continuous deposits into that emotional bank account. We need to fill it with love. We need to fill it with trust. And each person has their own way of feeling loved. Each person has their own way of feeling trusted. Each, pe each person has their own way of feeling significant. That's why it's important to treat people. You know, they say the golden rule is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Treat people the way you want to be treated. There's also the platinum rule, because platinum is more valuable than gold. It says treat people the way that they want to be treated. Because maybe a person doesn't want to be treated the way that you want to be treated. Maybe they have different preferences. So making, making deposits and continuous deposits. So we need to ask ourselves, when it comes to us and the concept of giving, the concept of contribution, are you creating value or are you extracting value? Every day and in each encounter, we can choose to be either a value creator or a value extractor. Value creators leverage every situation as an opportunity to bring more to the table than they take away. Sometimes we approach someone and we think, what can I get out of this relationship? What is this person going to give me? What can I take away from this person? And that determines whether we want to have that relationship or we don't want to have that relationship. What it's suggesting here is think the opposite. Think what kind of value can I bring? What value can I contribute? What value can I give? Not only what can I take? All of the good things we desire in life are the byproduct of creating value for others. So if you want, if you want something in your life, if you want the good things, if you've thought about all the good things that you want in your life, the way that you achieve that is by creating value for others, is by giving, is by contributing. If you can get people to their goal, then um, of course you'll, you'll get to your goal. So I wanna share something with you and um, I wanna talk about value creation in romantic relationships, my favorite subject. So what happens what happens when two people who are value extractors, meaning they want to take, they want to receive, they don't want to give, what happens when two value extractors get in a relationship with one another? I'm not talking about narcissists here. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about narcissists. Narcissism is a, is, is a widespread disease in our community. And the reason I ask that question, what happens, is because a lot of people walk around this world empty, broken, and, and, and they believe that others, in order, you know, in, in order for there to be a healthy relationship or a worthwhile relationship, someone else has to fill your cup. Someone else has to do your job that you should be doing on your own. Someone else has to come in and validate. Someone has to, that someone has to come in uh, and, and, and heal your wounds somehow. So we all walk around with these expectations thinking that our spouse owes us something, our parents owe us something, our children owe us something. That doesn't mean that there are not rights and responsibilities. The question I'm asking is what are your expectations? Your expectations are very important. So what happens when two people who are value extractors, people who want to take, get in a relationship? When two people who are both attempting to extract value from each other enter a relationship, it's akin to two leeches latching onto one another and sucking the lifeblood out of each other. And in some countries, instead of doing cupping, they use leeches. They put it on the back and on the head and on the eye. Have you seen some of them? They put it on the eye and, and different parts of the body, the tongue. But what does a leech do? It extracts the blood and they say that there is you know, health, health benefits to that. What happens if you put a leech on another leech? It's disastrous. I've never tried it, but I'm assuming that it could be disastrous because they're both trying to suck the lifeblood out of one another. So when two people whose mindset 
and whose intentions and his expectations is I'm going to receive from the other person and I'm not going to give to the other person. When they engage in a relationship, it becomes disastrous. It doesn't work. And I talk about this and some of you may think, well, this is common sense. Don't engage with someone who's selfish. Don't engage with someone who's greedy. Don't engage with someone who's a narcissist. Do you know what happens when a person falls in love? This thing, gone. No more. No, no more common sense. And even when we have common sense, common sense is not the same as common practice. Common sense is not common practice. Or else we would have a great world. But because common sense is not common practice, we don't have the kind of world that we want. So we have to also ask ourselves that when we offer, are you offering something with the expectation of return? So when a father provides value or a mother provides value or a spouse provides value, are you doing it because you want something in return? You expect someone to give back to you? You're expecting something to, to happen? Or do you do something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because it's the right thing to do. When you study the lives of the prophets and the imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, did they give people their giving, their contribution? Was it contingent upon the fact that these people were believers, mu'mineen, their followers? Absolutely not. There's a tradition. It says that one day, um, a man came to the Prophet Ibrahim ala nabina wa ala alihi afdhul salatu wa salam and um, Ibrahim invited this man in for a meal Ibrahim is a monotheist he's the father of monotheists so if anyone can preach about God and monotheism it's Ibrahim so he sits with him and the man right away without saying bismillah right away puts his hands in and Ibrahim looks and he, you know, he's sort of taken back. He's offended. He says, uh, he says aren't, you, aren't you going to mention the name of God? You're, you're sitting at, 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 at this ma'idah, at this table spread, and you dive right in and, and no mention of God, no dhikr. So the man looks at him. He says, what are you talking about? He says, God, you know, the person above. He says, I, I have no concept of this. I have no idea what you're talking about. So Ibrahim gets offended. So when he gets offended, the man senses and, and, and you know, the man gets up and leaves. I mean, he doesn't want to be, who wants to be in that kind of situation? Narration says that an angel came to Ibrahim and the angel said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a message for you, Ya Ibrahim. He says that we fed this man, we clothed this man, we gave him shelter. We gave him protection for decades and decades, his entire life. And not once did God ask him to pray to him. Who are you to ask if someone believes in God or does not believe in God? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him, gave this man everything for a lifetime. And God didn't send to him an angel or a messenger to tell him, okay, I've given you, now give me 50 years of prayer in return. Give me 50 years of zakat in return. So the lesson that Ibrahim learns is give without expectation. And sometimes we can give for years and years and months on end. And in the end, there's always a, a string attached. It's always conditional. Think about it. Think about the relationships that you have in your life. And are we ex expecting people, are we giving with the expectation of someone is going to give back? And do we get upset when they don't meet our expectations? And that's the story of the life of the Imams. I was thinking about this story. You know, our behavior, we, we should go out there and be able to, to, to plant seeds. Some seeds, when you plant them, they germinate and some other seeds do not germinate. I remember one time I learned this uh, lesson actually right here at the masjid. There was a time where and I don't know how the logistics in the kitchen work anymore. I, it's, it's not my area. But uh, when, when we would cater, 
the caterer would bring these large trays of salad and whatever was left at the bottom would not be poured into the sink because of all the seeds and all of that. It can get clogged if you do that week after week. So it would be poured outside in the, where, where the dirt is constantly. And I remember walking by one time and all of a sudden I smelled, if you've smelled the fragrance of a tomato plant, I smelled it. I said, what is this? So I began to, to dig there and all of a sudden three, four tomatoes ripe. Now it wasn't the intention. That was not the intention. The intention was, I'm, I'm just getting rid of this leftover, I don't know, salad water, whatever you want to call it. But what happened, the serendipity, and a serendipity is something that comes into your life without you expecting it. Something good that comes into your life without you expecting it. But it's not a coincidence. It's a result of something either you did good in your life, or sometimes it's a, a, a result of something good your parents did in their life. So many of us are so hard on our parents. We don't know what they did in order for us to live the blessed life that we live now. Or our grandparents. Or our great-grandparents. Or our ancestors. Never forget where you came from. So, the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt, they, they, uh, they lived a life of giving. Names are very, very important. And the name of uh, Imam Muhammad al-Jawad as I mentioned, al-Jawad is the giver, someone who is extremely generous. And he was known as a man of generosity. That's why it's important, my friends, to be intentional when you give names to your children, and not just names, but also nicknames. When you give nicknames to your children, be very intentional because your words matter and they can live up to that name. So Al-Jawad was a man of great generosity, contribution, and giving. Not only when it came to money, but when it came to his time, when it came to his knowledge. We're told that uh, one of the biographers, he describes the life of Imam Al-Jawad. He says that the salary that was given to him by Al-Ma'moon Al-Abbasi, every year was one million dirhams at a time where if you were to purchase a sheep it would cost one silver dirham one million so how much do sheep cost today i don't know a hundred dollars five hundred dollars so five hundred times a million is it safe to say that i don't know five hundred million i don't know maybe it was cheaper back then i remember it used to be a hundred now it's more expensive however much that's a lot of money that's not considering the fact that the, 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 the followers of Ahl al-Bayt they used to come and contribute the, the zakat and the khums. But did he live a lavish lifestyle? Was he riding the latest model horse? He wasn't doing that. He was giving it all away. All of it. Everything. He would give it all away. Redistribute it to the fuqara, the poor people, the destitute, those that were in need. Imagine. A million dirhams a year was his salary. Not only did he give money, he gave time. He gave his knowledge. Some of us, we can be very generous with money, but maybe we're not generous with our time. Maybe we're not generous with our love. We hold back our love. We're not generous with our akhlaq. We're not generous in other areas where it counts. We're not generous with our knowledge, our know-how. If you have something to give, your knowledge, give. Some people, they need what you know more than what you have. They need what you know more than what you have. So if you have expertise in a certain area, share that knowledge. And, and that was the personality of Imam al-Jawad salam. Many narrations, and you've heard these narrations where um, uh, you know, one time he sat, al Ma'mun al-Abbasi had, uh, you know, he had invited all of the scholars in the nation. And amongst them was Yahya ibn Aktham, the chief justice at the time. This is supposed to be the most knowledgeable person in all of Baghdad. And, uh, you know, he, 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 he sat with, with the Imam, and the Imam was very young at that time, perhaps in his late teenage years or his early 20s to test his knowledge. 
because it was known that he, he was the successor in the Shi'i community after Imam Ali ibn Musa Rida alayhi salam. So, so, so to test his knowledge, to test what he knew, and Yahya ibn Akhtham asks, asks him a simple question about the kafara, the expiation of someone who kills an animal during the Hajj season. So, you know, he thought, if you've seen that show, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? He thought he was able to, he was going to stump, he was going to stump him with a simple question. That's the whole philosophy of the show, if you haven't seen it. Adults being stumped by very simple questions. But he thought he was going to be able to stump him. So the Imam responds, and he branches out the question. He widens the scope of the question even further. He says, was this man inside of the haram or outside of the haram? Was he a free man or was he a slave? Was he wearing the ihram of Umrah or the ihram of Hajj? Was it during the day or was it during the night? Was it intentional or not intentional? What kind of animal was it? Was it a bird? Was it an insect? Did it crawl on all fours? Was it cattle? And so Yahya ibn Akhtham, he didn't have the oxygen for the climb. You know, he, he couldn't keep up with the pace. And out of that, in fact, since we're in the Hajj season, a lot of the uh, ahkam of Hajj that we follow, the rituals, the, the, the laws of Hajj that we follow, a lot of them are based in the hadith of this one hadith of Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam. A response that was given to Yahya ibn Akhtham. Narrations tell us that he would sit, and if you've ever been in a position of leadership, there's a lot of people that want your time. Sometimes you get bored after the fourth or fifth or sixth question. He would sit and answer hundreds of questions. He was a generous man. He gave his knowledge. He knew that people were not thirsty for money. People were thirsty for time. People were thirsty for significance. People were, 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 were thirsty for love, for affection. And he was a man of true affection. Of course, after all of this uh, attention that the Imam received, uh, Al Ma'mun died, and then uh, eventually uh, his brother Al Mu'tasim came into power. And Al Mu'tasim was a completely different beast. And he treated the Imams completely differently. And narrations tell us that he had plotted to assassinate the Imam by poison at the age of 24 years old. Imagine, 24 years old, being poisoned, writhing from pain when the poison entered his body. Sometimes when you become a giver and a contributor, through your good behavior, you highlight other people's bad behavior. Through your good intentions, you highlight other people's bad intentions. And that was the story of our ninth Imam. Narrations tell us that he began to writhe in pain and that he felt the pain of the poison in every part of his body. And that even when he died, there was not many people there from his followers immediately because they were, uh, they were taken away so that no one could be close to him during his final moments. إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات تابع بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك قاض الحاجات إنك على كل شيء قدير برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين couple of quick announcements since Tonight is the night of the first of the blessed month of the Hijjah. There are a number of a'mal that can be done in the first 10 days. Inshallah, next Saturday, not, next Saturday is the day of Arafah, not the day after tomorrow, but next Saturday, inshallah, would be the ninth, is the day of Arafah. There are many a'mal to be done on that day. And then Sunday, the day after, will be the day of Eid al-Adha, inshallah, and we will hold Eid prayers here. Uh, please wait for our announcement via email, but uh, we're projecting 9 a.m. Inshallah, we will have Eid prayers here. The Sunday after that, we also have our uh, Eid al-Ghadir celebration.
We would love to see all of you there. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ahli bayti al-tayyibin al-tahirin.